My name is Elaine First, and I'm a nurse. And nurses very often deal with everyday living problems. And one of the things that we deal with is coping with disease, coping with bad news, coping with things we have to live with every day. Coping with a chronic disease is a very confrontive title. It says, do you have what it takes? And I'm here to tell you, you do. You may not know that you do. And you were given this disease. It's like a big box that was delivered by FedEx. And you didn't know that you were going give to be given it, and you don't know what's inside. And it didn't come with a manual, or the manual was written in some language that you had no idea what it was. Um, and there it is. So we're going to talk about how to deal with this big box and what are you going to do with it. And possibly, what have you already done with it? So we're going to start by looking at some principles. We're going to define what coping actually is. Because if you don't know what, what coping is, then how do you know you're, going to, you're doing it or not doing it? We're going to look at some ways that help you and some ways that don't. And then we're going to share a little bit. You ready? All right. But first, I want to find out who's here today. Who is diagnosed with scleroderma? Who's the support person? How many of you have been diagnosed for under a year? <coughs> OK. We discovered one year that 50 to 60% of people who come to the conference every year are people who've been diagnosed for under a year. How about over a year but under five? OK. New, but not too new. How about more than five? All right. Um, more than 10? The first three to five years, on average, are the worst. Just to let you guys know. That's when the autoimmunity is the most active. That's when you're learning about the disease. That's when the most symptoms are going to happen. Um, that's when the most pain is going to happen. And the graph goes like this, and then it settles down. Um, that's the natural history of the disease. So. That's something to learn, and I'm hoping you guys have learned that. Um, it's also the time when you're going to see the most doctors. And you get all those appointments, and it's the most troubling time. And then you settle in. You find your support groups. You find your support system. You find out who your friends are or aren't. Or aren't. Um, the first thing we're going to do also is going to talk about some principles. We've got the human behavior principle. We've got the light bulb principle, the chronic disease principle, and the who's in charge here principle. Now, some of these you're going to guess, and some of these you're not going to guess. Human behavior principle. All behavior has a reason. Generally, people act the way they do to reduce psychological pain, to retain their sense of self and self-respect, to make themselves feel normal again, 
to stay comfortable physically and psychologically. Does that make sense? So there's a reason behind everything we do. So, what's the answer to this one? Okay, one at a dollar hundred and fifty dollars an hour. <laughs> but the light bulb has to want to change. That's because it's uncomfortable for people to change. We would rather have the devil we know that's poking us and poking us and poking us than the devil we don't know. We don't know what that poke's going to feel like. We don't know what that devil's going to do to us. So if we change, if we go to a different doctor, if we change our behavior, we don't know what that's really going to do to us. So it's very hard for some of us to change our behavior. Oh, and I got really fancy <laughs> with, with my illustrations here. The chronic disease principle is important for you to know because sometimes it affects what you think of yourself when you have a flare. And there will always be flares with autoimmune disease. It comes and goes. So it waxes and wanes, um, and there's always something you can do about it. You're going to have days when you're going to feel worse than other days. You're going to overdo on the days that you feel good, and then the next day you're going to pay for it. Or you're going to have a really good day, you're not going to overdo, you're going to be relaxed, and the next day you're going to feel terrible. And it's not going to be anything that you've done. And that's why you need to know about the fact that it waxes and wanes, because it's not anything you've done about it. I grew up with a mom who might catch a cold or flu and blamed herself for doing something wrong. And she didn't. She got in the way of a germ. Or she got in the, in the way of a, a virus. Sometimes you can prevent it and sometimes you can't. You can't beat up yourself about it. You need to back up and relax and just take it easy for that day. This is pretty important and goes to the title of this talk. Who controls your attitude? That's not a rhetorical question. <laughs> is it the psychiatrist who's changing the light bulb? New. No. Is it your husband or your kids? No. OK. Whenever I hear somebody say, you're making me so angry. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Not true. I'm getting angry right now because I've decided to get angry. at your behavior. I'm in charge of what I do. I'm in charge of my emotions. I'm in charge of my reactions to whatever's happening. And it's very difficult. It's difficult to take responsibility. But I'm an adult. And I am responsible for this and this. So I'm responsible if I give the kid a swat in his behind. This is my hand. 
This is my action, and I did it. So I'm responsible. And I can't victimize myself because I have an autoimmune disease. I can't become a victim. I can only think about what I can do and what I can't do. <coughs> That's very hard, especially the first few years of having a disease. It's very difficult. It takes a lot of work. It also takes support. You have to be thinking about what's going on inside your head and how are you going to face the rest of your life. Sometimes I hear patients say, scleroderma is the best thing that ever happened to me. And, I, and people think, what in hell is she talking about? This is a horrible disease. It could kill her. Why is she saying stuff like that? But sometimes people make an enormous change in themselves because of something that is so devastating to them. And they choose to make a big change in their lives. And I have seen people really change. One thing that they do is they go and see somebody. And it really helps them because it helps them to reorder their thinking about what are they going to do with the rest of their lives. They're being confronted by something that's very painful physically and is going to require a lot of changes. For one thing, it's going to require some, some financial changes. Some people are going to have to quit their jobs for the time being or reduce their jobs. It's, ex it's an expensive disease. Some people are going to have to change insurances. Some people are going to have to change the roles that they play in life. They're not going to necessarily have that child when they plan to have the kid. They're not going to be necessarily able to take care of the children that they have the way they planned. They're going to have to make some changes in that. They're not going to necessarily be able to take care of what they were going to take care of in the house. They're going to have to rely on family. That's going to reorder the roles in the family. So there are a lot of changes going on, and change is not always comfortable. So they go and see somebody, a psychologist, a nurse practitioner, a licensed family counselor, different kinds of people to help them think outside the box, to help them move ahead and make some changes. That's taking charge of their new life. So they have a new life. Deciding what you can do and what you can't do is also very important. Now this is also a process because it may not be the same five years from now as it is now, right? Because exactly. it gets better. And if you take charge of what's going on, and you have your support system in place, which includes a bunch of docs that know what they're doing, family, friends, your own brain, support groups. It's a process. So one year from now is going to be better than it is now. Two years from now is going to be better, hopefully, than now you're going to be able to know if you get a pulmonary function test that's not quite right, you're going to know what to do about it three years from now, four years from now, if it comes. See the guy with the scissors? He's taking charge. 
Okay, the first, I have to tell you, the first time I looked in the dictionary and found the word coping, I came up with a wall that had tiles on top that was shunting rainwater away from this wall. That's called coping, right? It, <laughs> it was a hardware website, and it talked about coping. That's what that was. But then I finally drilled down and I got to this. And it said, to manage distress and the problem underlying the distress. Manage is the operative word here. Not cure, it's manage. It's a process as well as an outcome. Okay, so it keeps going. So if you guys are impatient, think about changing that. Because a process is not immediate. And if, if you want things to happen really fast, it, it ain't gonna work. Coping successfully with a stressor may increase the body's ability to fight infection, decrease depression, and increase a feeling of well-being even though the disease continues. So you're feeling more powerful because you know what to do. Not that you are a small child, but think about a kid that has learned to ride a bike without the training wheels for the first time. And think about that kid's face. My six-year-old grandsons just did that. And I have a picture of their faces like joy and self-confidence and like, look at me, I did it. So that's the feeling you get. Guaranteed they're not going to get a cold for the next week because they're feeling powerful. So positive coping adds to quality of life, which, by the way, never used to be studied until about 10 or 15 years ago the docs were researching things like um, the nail fold capillaries and the skin scores and how it, the, skin's, the skin was tight and the blood work and all. About 10, 15 years ago, they started to look at quality of life. And now they've got the hack, DI, that you've made check off marks, hopefully, in your doctor's office to find out how you were coping with activities of daily living and so on and so forth. How many of you have filled out a activity of daily living thing in your doctor's office? Good. Quality of life, they're testing that and they're measuring it along with everything else. And that's a good thing. Negative coping can result in more disability because symptoms are ignored and negativity adds to pain. And you know, if you have a headache and there's a lot of noise around and a lot of people yelling and arguing and whatnot, that pain increases, right? Right. And I'm pretty proud of my rocks. Because there's your disease that's weighing you down and you don't have the coping skill, you may not have, especially at the beginning, the coping skills to balance out all the stress that your disease is causing you. Because it's new to you. So at the beginning, your disease is winning, the stress game. You don't quite know what to do about the GERD that you have that's really a problem in terms of your eating things that you like. 
um, you're having trouble with the skin and it's itching all the time and you don't really know quite what to do with that. Um, the, these red marks on your face are really giving you trouble and you really, you're covering them up but they're really bugging you. So here's a, a little list of some of the things that you're that are bothering you. <coughs> it's a partial list. How many of you had heard about scleroderma when when you got your diagnosis? One person in the room? One. How many of you went directly to the um, computer and looked it up? Yo. And how many of you got scared? And how many of you found the Scleroderma Foundation? And how many of you found websites that tried to sell you herbs? <laughs> and oils? How many of you bought them? <laughs> the oils. <laughs> okay, so there's fear because it's an unknown. And there's grief because there are some things that you've lost. We feel grief when we lose things. We lose our comfort. We lose our face. We lose mobility sometimes. And then we get angry. And why me? We get angry because we don't find the right doctor right away. And sometimes we find doctors that don't know squat and don't tell us they don't know anything, but they basically think they know and they tell us to go home and um, make out our wills. How many of you had a doctor like that? Two? Three, four, five. I'm sorry. I think that's awful. But I'm glad there's only four. Um, in a room like this, 15, 20 years ago, there would be many more. Because 25 years ago, it took seven years to get diagnosed. And right now, I think the average is one to two. So there is progress. And um, if you're going to get the disease, this is a good time because there's treatment. And there didn't used to be much treatment, but now there is. Um, there is pain and there's change in body image. And people struggle with that. There are sometimes there's change in family relationships because our roles change. We can't pick up our babies sometimes. We can't do the dishes like we used to. We can't cook like we used to because the hands don't work like they used to, um, especially at the beginning. Um, as I said, we have loss of income and there are other things. You want to add one? to this list. Like any of these. I know the fatigue is big. Um, autoimmunity is well known for fatigue.
These are some ways that people cope. And you'll notice that my pebbles are not lined up in nice rows. They're all mushed together there because could you, could you keep that door open? We might be able to get some air in there now that things are a little quieter outside. Thank you. Because there are negative ways that people cope. Coping doesn't automatically mean positive. You're still coping, but it's negative. You can hide from it. There are a lot of people who don't acknowledge that they have a problem. Won't talk about it may or may not go to a doctor, never come to a support group. And that's OK. If they go to the doctor, that's fine that they don't come to a support group. Not everybody needs a support group. But not going to a doctor is not a good thing. They can stay depressed. This is not a good thing. Drugs and alcohol don't help. Pushing people away doesn't help. We need people as long as they are helpful. Negative people are not good. Sometimes we need to focus on what we've lost in order to move on. You have to talk about what you've lost. You have to talk about the depression. You have to be angry. You really need to, to see a therapist for this and talk about it and talk about it and talk about it because that's what the therapist is there for. And don't talk about it all the time to your sister or your husband or whatever. That's not necessarily what they're there for. Victimizing yourself is time consuming, exhausting, and doesn't work. That doesn't work either. That just makes you tired. That just makes you sicker. That's your right. But it also makes you sicker. But these are some positive ways. These are probably what you're doing because you're in here. If you weren't in this room, I don't think you were trying to learn how to cope with what you've been delivered. So you're certainly trying to educate yourself. That's what everybody coming to this conference is. In fact, probably by the end of today, if you hear the word scleroderma one more time, you're probably going to scream. <laughs> That's what one of my friends used to say when she would come to conference. Recognizing and accepting the emotions is really important and it's really hard. Educating yourself in many, many, many ways is what you're going to be doing for the rest of your life. Especially because, thank goodness and thanks to all the people in the, across the world and in the community of medicine and so forth, who are working on this, they're making great strides. So things are changing. And next year when you come, or the support group education days that you go to, you're going to be hearing new things. Um, and and that, that's exciting. That's exciting every time I go to one of these big medical conferences to see rooms filled to overflowing with people from across the world 
seriously from across the world who are talking about the new things that are happening in scleroderma research. Because 30 years ago, you could fill up this section of people. That was it. It's fabulous. These people are all working for you. It's a great thing. Um, find the right doctor. Because one of the hallmarks of a successful patient is to have a team. And one of the main person in the team is the physician and all the other physicians that work with him or her. Build your support team, the physician, the nurses, the support group, your family. Have fun. Ask for help. Define what that help is. Accept the help. Give help. Volunteer. When you're feeling good, one of the other things about being a successful patient is to give help to somebody else that might need it. Treat yourself. Go to a movie, have an ice cream, take yourself to Italy. <laughs> hey, I ain't kidding. There, there are ways of doing that. Defy the verdict, like you in the back row. Defy the verdict. Go back to that doctor that said, go home and make your will, and say, excuse me, I'm here. Anything else that's positive that you can think of? That you yourself have found to be helpful? Yep, Bunny. I can attest to that. One, one year at conference, I was supposed to stand up on a stage and what was I supposed to do? I, I think I was supposed to do an MC job or something. And they made me a costume. They made me a costume out of, <laughs> out of a tablecloth. And they, and they stole feathers from one of the vases in the hallway, and I walked out there, it was hysterical. It was hysterical. I made them burn the pictures, though. <laughs> so yeah. Totally. Totally. They asked me what I, who I was wearing, right? Who are you wearing, Elaine? I said, bunny. <laughs> um, yeah, laughing. Somebody else said that when she's feeling really fatigued and down and she's laid out on the couch that she plays um, all of the videos of all the comedies that she loves. And she laughs and has a good time, just like Karen was saying in there. Anybody else? Music. Music. It's good. You know, this stuff changes blood pressure. And it does change um, the blood work. It does. It changes the immune system. Hugs, too, by the way. If you hug someone that cares about you and that you care about, for 20 seconds, Dr. Clements will say this to you, for 20 seconds, it changes your blood pressure and your immune system. Got to be for 20 seconds, though. Yeah? I, I think it's tough to broaden your focus and uh, not focus so much on it to remember that there's other good things and that there, there, cause you can become a, a little despondent if when you focus too much on it. You have to realize there's a lot more in life than just that one aspect, whether it's kids, grandkids. 
Yep. Other good things in life. Yep. I like this. Yep. Focus on other things. Right. Oh, look. with scleroderma. Ask yourself. I mean, if you make it into a learning exercise, because that's what it is. You're learning to deal with something new. Take those skills that you already have about learning. You've all been through some sort of learning exercise. College, high school, learning a craft, learning trade, something. Take that kind of learning exercise and apply it. And keep your medical records. Put those, all those medi medications, keep a list. Make the changes. Make sure you've got your medical records because they belong to you. Put them in a folder, loose leaf folder. Make sure that you've got them. Make sure that you've got copies. Carry them around with you in your car. This is all something that you need to carry around, especially the medications, because you should carry them in with you. If you, God forbid, have to go to the ER, they should be with you. Then the, because you may not be going to your hospital, and if you have to go to another hospital, you can whip them out and say, this is what I'm on. That's another lecture I do, by the way. OK, so what's successful coping? Take care of yourself and the disease and function. That's successful. You recognize your abilities and your disabilities. You're realistic about what you can do and what you can't do. This, this is not specific to scleroderma. This is specific to life. Because this goes for people who are aging, which is like all of us. I don't think we are ever really satisfied. And we, maybe we shouldn't be, because being a little bit dissatisfied might spur us on to get better. To look at somebody else and say, oh, I like what she's doing with that. I'm going to go to that class. Or, oh, I haven't learned how to play the ukulele yet. Or, oh, I used to play the ukulele. Where is that thing? I'm going to go change those, those key, those strings, and do it again. <coughs> this is one of the mantras that people have. I have scleroderma, but scleroderma doesn't have me. Take a break from the disease. So you can say, OK, we've got 36 hours. We're going to go up the coast, go to this bed and breakfast in Cambria. We are not saying that word at all for 36 hours. It's amazing to me how 36 hours, how long that is. We did that once when we were living in Iowa, and we got somebody to take care of these little kids that we had. And we went to this bed and breakfast that was like an hour and a half away, because that's a, how far I would allow myself to go away from these little kids. And that we were up there. We had dinner. 
stayed overnight, walked in the woods, and went back home the next day by noon. And it felt like three days. And it was amazing, amazing. So I'm just going to ask you the first question, because I think we're done, right? We got a little, what, 10 minutes? Am I done at noon? Yeah. OK, I'm just going to ask you the first question. The rest of the questions I want you to ask yourself as the beginning for self-awareness. Maybe you could put that at the beginning of your loose leaf notebook.